In this video, I'm going to walk you through the post lab for lab seven, colligative properties and the Van't Hoff factor. The first problem is data that you took while you were measuring the freezing point of cyclohexane. In the lab, you measured the mass of an empty piece of glassware, and then you put some cyclohexane in it and remeasured the mass again. In this first box, uh, or third box, I guess, you'll be calculating the mass of the cyclohexane, which is going to be the difference between the empty glassware and the glassware with the cyclohexane in it. Then in this next spot, you will be reporting from lab the freezing point of cyclohexane that you measured. So this is the experimentally determined freezing point. Again, this is the number that you measured in lab. In this spot, you will be looking up the freezing point of cyclohexane. This is a number that you're going to get either from your textbook or the internet. So you'll just need to do a Google search search on that. I do want to kind of point out when you're looking this up, the freezing point is exactly the same thing as the melting point. So you might find a freezing point for cyclohexane or you might find a melting point for cyclohexane. They are exactly the same thing. Freezing is when we have a liquid that's turning into a solid. Melting is when we have a solid turning into a liquid. And both of these transitions, of course, take place at the exact same temperature. So if you find it written as a melting point, don't worry, that's the exact same thing. Down here, you're going to calculate your percent error. The percent error uh, instructions are in this spot down below. It is the difference between the actual freezing point, that's going to be the number you look up, the experimentally determined freezing point, that's going to be the number you measured, and you'll divide that by the actual freezing point, again, the number that you look up, multiply it by 100 to express it as a percent. Now in the, the next um, part of the experiment, you put a solid in the cyclohexane and you remeasured the freezing point. So you're going to take this mass of cyclohexane, whatever this number is right here, and we're actually going to copy it to the next data table. So whatever this number is, it is going to get copied into this spot right here. The mass of cyclohexane, um, your post lab says that it is from problem number one, goes into this spot. You also had that unknown solid, you weighed it out on the balance, so you're going to have a mass of that as well. And then um, the mass of the cyclohexane solvent, this is calculated by taking the mass of the cyclohexane in grams and converting it to kilograms. So this is a gram to kilogram conversion where we're just simply using this mass of cyclohexane and converting it into kilograms. I do want to emphasize that this is only the mass of the cyclohexane. We're not including the mass of the unknown in this particular part. The KF for cyclohexane, this is a number that I want you to look up, even though I didn't write that down on the post lab. Look that up in your textbook or on the internet. Copy it because remember, this is a constant. We're not trying to figure out what it is. The freezing point of the solution, this is the number that you measured when you did the experiment, so you're going to write that number down. The actual freezing point of cyclohexane, well, we've already looked that up once. That's going to be this number right here, whatever you've already looked up. You're going to copy it in this spot, the value from the textbook or the internet. Now in this spot, you're going to calculate the change or the difference in the freezing point. This is going to be the difference between the freezing point of your solution and the freezing point of pure cyclohexane. And you want to make sure that this is an absolute value again, so you want this to be a positive number, not a negative number. We're going to calculate the molality of the solution using the freezing point depression equation. So we're going to derive this from the equation delta Tf equals Kf little m. And in this situation, the molality is the thing that we don't know. So I'm going to rearrange this equation right here. We're going to calculate the molality by taking the change to the freezing point and dividing it by the freezing point constant. The change to the freezing point is calculated in this spot and the freezing point Nope, that's wrong. The freezing point constant, you looked it up, it's right there. So that's going to give you the molality. Then you're going to use the molality to calculate the moles of the unknown sol solute. Remember that molality, little m, is calculated by taking the moles of the solute and dividing by the kilograms of the solvent. So if we're trying to calculate the moles of the solute, we want to rearrange this equation right here. Moles is going to be calculated in this case by taking the molality and multiplying it by the kilograms of the solvent. The molality, you calculated in this box, and the kilograms of the solvent, you calculated or you did that unit conversion up there. So that's going to give you the moles. And then the last thing you're going to do is calculate the molecular weight of the solute. That is going to simply be taking the grams and dividing it by the moles. The grams are the mass of the unknown, so all the way up here, and the moles you calculated in this spot right there. 
Now let's move on to our next data table. In the next data table, this is our last page. Um, we have, you did two experiments here that were pretty similar with two different concentrations of sucrose measuring the freezing point of a solution. So this would be the freezing point that you recorded in lab. The actual freezing point of water you will look up on a textbook or the internet, or maybe you just happen to know that. And then you're going to calculate the change to the freezing point of water. This is going to be the difference between the freezing point of the solution and the freezing point of pure water that you looked up on the internet. That'll be the same for both of these boxes. In this experiment, we are experimentally determining the KF value of water. So that means that we are going to be taking the equation delta T F equals molality times, I wrote that backwards, KF, times molality. And in this case, we don't know, or we're pretending like we don't know the value of Kf. So that means if we're going to rearrange that equation, Kf can be calculated by taking the change to the freezing point and dividing it by the molality. So I just rearranged this equation, turned it into this guy right here. The change to the freezing point, delta Tf, that's this number right there, and the molality is given to you up here at the top. Um, for this spot, you'll be using 1.0 as your molality. The actual KF value you're going to look up from the internet or look up on in your textbook, or maybe you just remember it, and then you're going to calculate your percent error. That's going to be the actual KF value divided by the experimental KF value divided by the actual KF value. And the actual KF value, that's the one you're looking up, experimental KF value, that's the one that you calculated, multiply all of this by 100 to turn it into a percent. For your last box, pretty similar type stuff. So you've got your freezing point of solution that you measured in the lab, the actual freezing point of water that you're going to look up in, in your textbook or in the internet, and the change to the freezing point, which is, again, going to be the difference between the freezing point of the solution and the freezing point of pure water that you've looked up on the internet. The actual KF value of water, you're gonna look up from the textbook or the internet. This time, you're not gonna use your KF value that you calculated in problem three, you're gonna look it up, and we're gonna de be determining the value of I. So to do that, we'll be again using this equation for delta TF, delta TF equals I K F M, if we want to rearrange this equation to isolate the i variable, that's going to be i equals delta tf divided by kf times little m. Our delta t is right here. Our kf we're going to be using from the internet or from your textbook. And the molality is up here at the top of the data table. Make sure you're using a different molality for this data over here. Um, this is going to give you the experimentally determined value of i. The predicted value of I is what you would use just based off of, or what you would assume based off of the formula for calcium chloride. So just sort of looking in your notes about what is the definition of I and how do we predict the def or predict the value of I based on a molecular formula, CaCl2, what would you expect that I to be? And we're going to use that to calculate the percent error. The percent error is going to be our actual value of I divided by, or I'm sorry, subtracted the difference, subtracting the experimental value of I divided by the actual value of I. For the actual value of I, we're gonna go with the predicted value right here, and experimental will be the one that we calculate. Now you might be, like if you're looking at some sources, you might be saying, oh, well the actual value of CaCl2 uh, is not what we would predict based on the formula, and I know that. But for the purposes of this lab, I want you to use the predicted value as your actual value, and not use um, uh, an actual value that might have been published on the internet.